Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at doing some example problems using the equations and the maths for describing projectile motion that were described in the previous video. So let's look at an example problem here. Some of you may recognise the golfer, the young golfer in the picture there. Some of you may recognise the golf course in the picture there. Now, when we start out with a question, we always really want to write the information down in the question and if it helps, draw a diagram. So how might we do that here? So I've got a golf ball here. It's about to be launched. The velocity that it's an initial velocity it's about to be launched with is 52 metres per second. And it's being launched at an angle of 15 degrees. So, the first thing it's asking us to do is calculate the initial vertical velocity. So in the previous um, video we talked about how we calculate that. This formula is given to you on your formula sheet. The vertical velocity is equal to VV times V, or VV, the vertical velocity equals the velocity times sine theta. So that's equal to 52 times by the sine of 15, which is equal to 13.5 metres per second. Okay, the, horiz uh, yeah, the horizontal component can be calculated in a similar way. VH equals V times cos theta equals 52 times by the cosine of 15, which is equal to 50.2 metres per second. Sorry, I'm jumping between notation there, but we hopefully should be comfortable with that at year 12. Okay, the next part asks us to calculate the speed of the ball after one second. So note that it just says speed there, so we don't need to worry about the direction in this case. That's quite common in tests and exams to just ask for the speed, so we don't need to worry about working out normally the angles if that is the case. Um, so, firstly, the horizontal speed of the ball stays constant, it doesn't change, that's equal to 50.2 metres per second. The vertical component of the ball, however, will change. It starts out at 13.5 metres per second, but as the ball goes up, that will be slowly decreasing as gravity will be acting against it. So our initial VV0 vertical velocity is 13.5 metres per second. But obviously acceleration is acting on that. And that's acting in the opposite direction. So if we've said positive is upwards is positive 13.5, it's acting at minus 9.8 metres per second per second in a downwards direction. So if we put that into the formula, VV equals the initial vertical velocity, VV0, plus A times T, that's equal to 13.5 plus negative 9.8 times by time, so it's after one second. So that's equal to 13.5 minus 9.8, which is equal to 3.7 metres per second. So now, to calculate the speed of the ball after one second, we need to combine that horizontal component, which is constant, at 50.2 metres per second, with that vertical component, which after one second is 3.7 metres per second. So the total there, using our tail to tip rule, we can show there. How do we work out that? We work that out with Pythagoras. So that's, if you like, our total velocity. V will equal the square root of 50.2 squared, make that more look like a bracket, plus 3.7 squared, which is 
equal to 50.3 meters per second. Okay, so now let's look at the time of flight and how we calculate that. Um, firstly, there's two ways to really consider this. Um, firstly, if we think about that time of flight, so we don't have any, this is a, a launch height equals landing height. So we are essentially using that formula that I showed you before, that time is equal to V minus V initial velocity divided by acceleration. So we know the initial vertical velocity because it's the vertical velocity here that tells us about um, the time of flight because gravity acts in a vertical direction and that's what controls time of flight. Um, so we know the initial vertical velocity, we know the acceleration. Now the tricky bit here is the final velocity and there's two ways to tackle this problem. If we just consider the, the ball going up, well the final vertical velocity, so if we consider what I call the to the top method, the final vertical velocity is going to be equal to zero. And then if we use that method we need to know that it takes the ball the same amount of time to come down as it took to go up. So whatever time we've got to do, we've got to sort of double that time at the end. If we, the other way to think about it, and different people prefer different ways, and I'm happy to explain both, is that if we consider what I call the whole flight method, that means that the final velocity, what was like whatever velocity it loses on the way up, it'll gain on the way down, because gravity is constant; it's acting the whole time, so that it acts for the same amount of time on the way up as on the way down. So that, that means that the final velocity in that case will be equal to the initial velocity, but in the opposite direction. So it'll be basically minus V, V, zero. And then obviously if we use that method, we don't have to double the time. So um, I'm going to use the second method there for this time. As I said, you could use either. So the time of flight in that case would be equal to the final velocity, which is downwards at 13.5 metres per second, equal and opposite to the initial, minus the initial velocity, which is 13.5 metres per second, divided by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8. Now remember, gravity is acting downwards. We've said downwards is the negative direction, so that needs to be negative. That's good because otherwise we'd end up with a time of flight which is negative, which would mean we were travelling backwards in time. Sometimes when we hit golf shots we do want to travel backwards in time, but it's not really going to happen unfortunately. And that leaves us with a time of flight of 27 divide, uh, minus 27 divided minus 9.8, which is equal to 2.76 seconds. Okay, calculating the range of the ball is actually fairly straightforward. As I said before, range is the horizontal displacement, which is equal to the horizontal velocity times by the time of flight. So that's equal to 50.2 times by 2.76, which is equal to 138 meters. Now, a bit of fun with the last part, to determine whether the ball went in the hole. So, if you've got really good eyesight, you might be able to see on that sign that it says this hole is 137 meters long. Or if you've ever played the fourth hole at Roxby Downs, you'd also know it's 137 metres long. So that would basically mean this ball has gone 138 metres, so it's gone one metre past the hole. Now that makes a whole lot of assumptions, which we couldn't necessarily make. It assumes that the landing height equals the launch height. 
If you've played the fourth hole at Roxby, you'll know it's uphill, so that doesn't quite apply. It assumes there's no air resistance, and in the case of golf balls, air resistance does have some significant effect. It also assumes that you hit the golf ball straight, which isn't always the case. Okay, let's look at another example problem. A ball is kicked horizontally off a cliff 20 metres above sea level with an initial speed of 10 metres per second. Calculate the time of flight and hence the range. So I've already just started the diagram here to save a little bit of um, time. So, but you would start out by drawing a diagram and then basically writing down, and I'll do it on the diagram, the key information for that question. So the ball has an initial velocity in the horizontal direction of 10 meters per second and straight away I'm thinking well what's the vertical component there well it's horizontal so that's equal to zero the rest of the ball therefore well, all of the velocity is in the horizontal direction so there's a 10 meters per second horizontal component the cliff is 20 meters above sea level so that's telling us that if you like our vertical displacement, is how we'd probably think of it in terms of the physics, is 20 metres. And the ball's going to come down here, something like this. We want to know the range of the ball, so it comes off the cliff there. So basically that's going to be our range, which is our horizontal displacement. So... And to work out that horizontal displacement, we're going to need to first work out the time of flight. So, in the previous problem, we knew the final velocity of the projectile and we knew the initial velocity. But in this case, we only know the initial vertical velocity. We don't know the final vertical velocity. So we can't find the time of flight using that previous method. We'd have two unknowns in that equation. So we need to use that other method I talked about in the previous video, which comes from from this formula here. I'm not going to show the rearrangement, but just to remind you of the formula it comes from, which you should be familiar with working with from previous years. So once we all rearrange that and we know the initial vertical velocity here is equal to zero, so we can forget that first term, we end up with time equals the square root of two times by the vertical displacement, so we're interested in the vertical direction, that's where gravity acts, divided by acceleration, which is equal to 2 times 20 divided by 9.8, and the square root of all that, which equals 2.02 .02 seconds, is our time of flight. Then um, once we know the time of flight, the range which is our horizontal displacement, is equal to the horizontal velocity, which is constant, times by the time of flight. So that's equal to 10 times by 2.02 .02 seconds, which is equal to 20.2 metres. Okay. So based on everything we've just looked at there, you really should now, if you look in... Chapter 1, which is the projectile motion chapter of your workbooks, you should be able to do from question 1 through to question 11. So if you haven't already started, made a start on those, that's really what you should be working on now. Thanks.